I'm Bruce Bugby, and in this video I want to talk about our research over, especially over the last 10 years and even over the last 20 years of the effects of colors of light on photosynthesis and plant shape. And I'm calling this towards an optimal spectral quality for plant growth and development. Now, what do we mean by plant growth and development? When we say plant growth, we mean an increase in dry weight of the plants, and that directly comes from photosynthesis. When we say development, we mostly mean plant shape. Is it a tall skinny plant, the short fat plant? You can see you could have the same size plant with very different shapes. Spectral quality has an effect on photosynthesis, but it has a much bigger effect on plant shape. And most of the time when we're changing ratios of colors, we're doing it to affect plant shape. And I'll walk through this, both plant growth and development. Plant shape varies among species. Different species have different responses to spectral quality. Photosynthesis does not vary among species much at all, but you will see there's evidence that our historic definition of photosynthetic photons is now coming into question. So I first want to acknowledge NASA. They have funded my laboratory now for over 30 years and that has allowed us to do some very basic research on spectral quality on photosynthesis and development. We also recently got a grant from the USDA. It's through the University of Georgia. It is called the LAMP Project, Lighting Approaches to Maximize Profits. This is a more applied uh, project to look at spectral quality and plant shape. Big implications for supplemental lighting in greenhouses, big implications for indoor agriculture and vertical farming. So let's get started. Let's look at this. I want to acknowledge two people that in the trenches that did the work. Shu Yang Zhen, a postdoctoral fellow and now a research scientist in my lab, and Paul Kasuma, a PhD candidate. He came from the University of Florida. The work I'm showing you is largely done by these two young scientists. So we talk about what things affect plant growth and we talk about nine cardinal parameters and here they are. Temperature, humidity, root zone temperature, nutrients, oxygen, wind, CO2, and light. The parameter right here on the top. Most of the time we're working to optimize these to use the given light. That, that we have and for generations we haven't been able to change the light. We just optimize what we get from the sun. Now that we can change the light, boom, it, this is a huge parameter. This we change and then we re-optimize everything depending on the light. Think about it, when you increase the light, it increases the flux of water through the plant and that automatically changes everything. Changes the nutrient solution ratio. To it, that makes more respiration. They need more oxygen. They need a lot more water. It means that CO2 becomes cost effective to elevate. Um, temperature and humidity are higher, so we need more wind. Changes the everything. So, light's a big deal. This slide summarizes something like 30 years of photobiology for me, personally, we have four categories of light in this. Blue photons inhibit cell expansion. Now that sounds terrible, but if it's stem elongation, blue photons are terrific. They keep plants shorter. There's some variability among plants. But this inhibition of cell stem elongation means shorter plants, and that's a huge factor. It also means reduced leaf expansion, which is bad. Here's an example of blue photons. This is 5% blue right here. Let's go back to pen. There we go. This is 5% blue right here. 
Look at how tall that is, and we increased the blue to 20, and the height of the plant decreased. So there's the power of uh, blue photons. Those two plants, by the way, are young cannabis plants. They're medical hemp. We're one of the few universities in the United States with the license to study medical hemp. So we're doing research on hemp along with the many, many food crops. Green photons facilitate human vision. They're primarily important so we can diagnose subtle nutritional disorders, insects and disease. There's an old Chinese phrase that says the best fertilizer is the footsteps of the farmer. And green photons are like fertilizer because we can see the plants and diagnose problems. In the early days of LEDs, there was a misperception that green photons were not used efficiently and we made LEDs with blue and red photons and that led to lots of problems. We have purple plants, you couldn't see them. Um, fortunately, those types of LEDs are diminishing. We're putting a lot more white LEDs in our fixtures to get the green photons so we can see the plants. Red photons are terrific. They're efficient photosynthesis. They're efficient LEDs. Um, they're like the potatoes of the diet. We want a lot of red photons to drive photosynthesis. Even though all of these drive photosynthesis, red photons are better. They're about 15% better than blue photons for photosynthesis. And finally, new kid on the block, far red photons enhance cell division, so they counteract the blue in the same way that blue photons make them shorter, we can bring in the reds to make them tall again. So the middle categories here, green and red, are doing their job. They're the background light. The biologically active colors are blues and far reds because we can shrink and sw swell stems in this business. Let's take a look at green photons. You could see here's green lettuce under blue LEDs. It looks purple, um, and this is that's everybody's seen graphs like this. These are not these are not really uh, these are magenta colored LEDs, but very hard to see the plants in those. All right, let's take a closer look at all of these now. Here's far red. Now this is a little bit of a small picture, but this is white light. And we added, in this study, Paul Kasuma added 10% of the photons as far red. They're like magic to lettuce. They dramatically improve cell expansion, and we got a much bigger lettuce plant. So for lettuce production, far red is a very powerful color of light. Unfortunately, it stops with lettuce. Most other species, we add far red and we get tall plants. And that's unfortunate, but... Uh, that's the, the nature of far red, but it's still a powerful tool to manipulate plant growth. So there's a summary of these colors of light. Now, let's take a look at how much they penetrate leaves. Blue is absorbed heavily by chlorophyll A and B. So here's a leaf right here, the top and bottom of a leaf, and it's absorbed in the top layer. Compare that to green. Look at green. It penetrates the leaf all the way to the bottom, lights up the spongy mass of fill. Uh, um, it's, it's terrific for its penetrating power. Red is just like blue, absorbed in the very top layer of the leaf. Um, it uh, doesn't penetrate nearly as well as green. And finally, far red penetrates even better than green. It, it goes deep into the leaf, and uh, that's a good thing for the cases of leaf. So this is, a, this is from this paper right here, Brodersen and Vogelmann. Uh, it's a beautiful paper, these the nice images. I added the far red. They didn't study far red, but, but these are nice side views of a leaf with penetration of light. Let's look at efficiency of LEDs. Here's our primary colors that we get. If we do efficiency, which is watts of photosynthetic photons out, per watt of electric energy in, that's efficiency because the units in the denominator and the, in the numerator and the denominator are exactly the same. Wow, 
Blue chips, not fixtures yet, just the chips, 88% efficient. That's incredible how far blues have come. White LEDs are a phosphor converted blue. And we can get pretty good phosphors, but white is a little bit less than the blues, 80%. And then the reds and the far reds are uh, slightly less efficient. So this is efficiency, but we know that watts of energy doesn't cause photosynthesis. Photons cause photosynthesis. So this column is micromoles of photons per joule of energy. And these are the peak numbers we get out. These are staggeringly high. Most high pressure sodium on this comes in at about, I'm going to put it down here, high pressure sodium comes in at 1.7, maybe 1.8. LEDs are approaching twice the efficiency. LED chips, not the fixtures yet. Let's review this a second because this is a very confusing to people. What this is, is micromoles of photons per second divided by joules of electricity per second. And you can see how this simplifies to micromoles per joule. A joule per second is a watt, so we can say micromoles per second per watt. That's the same thing here. But it's the, new, the key here is that the numerator is moles of photons, the denominator is electric energy or electric power. Um, this is power to power. Now, this is good news for the future because eventually these LEDs make their way into fixtures and we, we can do great things with them. We have one more column. What's in that third column? How about the price of these? What's it cost to buy these? The cool whites are mass produced because of human lighting in large quantities, so their prices drop significantly compared to these other colors. Here's the relative price. 1x for uh, white LEDs, 10x for the reds, and the blues and the far reds are still 30x. This is not an inherent problem, it's just economy of scale. As we make more and more and more of these by the millions, these prices will keep coming down and LEDs will get more cost effective. Let's look at a few spectral effects. These are cannabis plants close to harvest. We did a study with blue fraction on cannabis. This is 4%. Now, for, the, for those of you that know blue fractions, this was high pressure sodium lights. These are LEDs, all of these. They're all white LEDs with different fractions of blue, and we ramped it all the way from 4% all the way up to 20%. Now in this case, there was no difference on height because we grew them vegetatively in the same environment and moved them into this at flowering. What about yield? Here's the flower yield. No difference. It looks like there's a trend and then it goes back down. Look at the standard deviations. There is no difference in yield at all among these treatments, indicating that the photosynthesis was similar in all these treatments, and the partitioning to flowers was similar. Um, this is an amazing slide because there is a lot of people that really feel that colors of light are just magic to cannabis yield. You need just the right colors. This doesn't prove there'll never be a difference. It's just in this carefully done study where all the plants were in one big room and had the same air, the same humidity, the same CO2, we didn't see a difference in yield. What about the cannabinoids in the plants? Surely this bust of blue must have done something. The next slide is cannabinoids. Here's the flowers at harvest, same thing, four to 20%. 
These were medical hemp, so we, we, they have mostly CBD, but some THC. Look at the THC, 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 0 0.6, exactly the same. There was no effect of colors of light and ratios of colors, and especially blue, on THC production, and there was no effect on CBD either. So, the choice of lamp for lighting cannabis should be based on the economics of the lights, not on the proposed, uh, hypothesized differences in cannabinoid synthesis and yield of the flowers, at least according to this study. We're replicating this study now, but it's a significant finding for uh, this. And I'm still not recommending any particular lights. I'm just saying the LEDs were no better than the HPS. They were no worse than HPS. However, if we did yield per kilowatt hour, these LEDs would win. They're more efficient than the high pressure sodium because the light intensity, the photosynthetic photon flux, was kept exactly equal in this study and it took more energy to make the photons for high pressure sodium. In this treatment, I'll draw it right here, here's a high pressure sodium lamp, that has a lot of thermal radiation. It's concentrated, a thousand watts in a small area. So to make the thermal radiation the same, we put a piece of tempered glass below the light and that blocked even, even more of the light, but it made the thermal radiation more similar among these treatments because we didn't want to get differences in this treatment by thermal radiation. We're also studying the edges of photosynthetic radiation. And these are a couple final slides on that. Here's our classic curve. This is 400 to 700, which we always say is photosynthetic radiation. This in here is, we call it PAR, photosynthetic radiation, and more precisely, PPFD. Now look at that sharp cutoff, right at 700. Really? A, a photon at 699 is valuable, and one at 700, one is not? We know it's not sharp. We've just approximated it for years because it tilts like this. But we now have a very efficient far red LED, and it peaks at 730, it looks like this. We have studied that LED for far red, and those photons are photosynthetically active. So we need to rethink our definition of photosynthesis with this in mind. They're not directly photosynthetic, they're synergistic with these shorter wavelengths in here, and when they're coupled together, they're, they're uh, synergistic. This was discovered in the 1950s by Emerson, and it's called the Emerson Enhancement Effect, but it sat there for half a century, and not, we didn't study it until now that we have far-red LEDs. We're taking a close look at the value of far-red. On the other end of the spectrum, <coughs> UV photons. Is this a sharp cutoff? How well are these UV photons used? The next two slides show some of our work on UV photons. Here's why those edges are so important. When we look at the photon flux of these colors, we have a violet LED that peaks right at 400. Can we effectively use that for photosynthesis and get a lot of the value of UV blue LEDs, and here's the one at 730, here's 700 right there. That's the 730 LED, can we use that one? Turns out we can for photosynthesis. What about this one? And what about wavelengths in here? You often see pictures of LEDs showing the energy flux, and on an energy basis, these are lower than these. The most efficient is blue, but that's not what drives photosynthesis, it's photon flux. When we graph the same data by photons, the reds and the blues are virtually identical. It's, it's a tremendous thing. This is from a paper that we recently got published in the journal Nature, LEDs for Photons, Physiology, and Food. Um, and it, it analyzes in this paper the economics of LEDs. 
This is the very famous McCree curve. Here's a picture of Keith McCree as a young scientist. He died just a few years ago. He had a long and distinguished career. He was a physicist that came across to biology. He said, oh my, these biologists need help. And he, he brought a, a excellent physics background with him. He, this is his curve, how the colors of light caused photosynthesis. It's called the McCree curve now. And he said, let's call it good. We'll cut this off at 400 and 700. But our data indicates that this curve should shift over here some, like this. It doesn't, it, when the, because of the synergism, synergism of far red, it shifts that curve. This curve also tilts, and these photons just below 400 are pretty good. But when you carefully read McCree's papers, there's 700, there's 400, you see this graph. Now this graph, this is, this, this is exactly the same as this. It's just graphed a little bit differently. These, and here's 400 and 700, these bars right here were the range of species from his paper. My, my students and I made this graph from his data. Th there was very little variability among species in his data, but what people forget is that he also, in addition to taking plants from the field, he took plants from a growth chamber. He grew them in a growth chamber. Look at the difference. Some of these photons right here are almost as good as red and they're close to UV photons. There was an enormous range of variability among species in McCree's trial. So we're re-examining this part of the curve right now, particularly with violet LEDs, which are just right here on the edge. Our hypothesis is that the field-grown plants synthesize compounds to block UV to protect themselves, and once they synthesize those, the UV photons were not effective in photosynthesis. Those, those compounds are made in the cuticle, but the growth chamber plants that didn't see UV didn't make the compounds, and now the UV photons are valuable. So this is the cutting edge of the research we're doing on uh, photobiology, and I'm gonna stop here, and I will pick this up in another video. Thanks for listening.